very, very thin. They have some signs and symptoms of a dehydration, pallor. Yeah, pretty bad. Sometimes it's just that um, mom did not know how to prepare the formula. And sometimes they're just not feeding the child. So are they trying to save money? Pardon? I said, are they trying to save money and diluting the formula? That's true. Yeah, that's true. Making money off, yeah. Somebody told me, um, maybe, I don't know, last semester or before that, that some people sell their breast milk. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was my yeah. Time. Isn't that illegal? Uh, no. I would think that. Is it illegal? It's not no, illegal. it's not illegal. It's, it's yours. Yours. No, why would it be illegal? It's mostly for mothers who can't <laughs> buy it. Yeah. yeah, supposed to be, yeah. Or if the baby's not thriving. That's a big, big industry. I don't know. Yeah. And if the baby's not yeah. thriving, they can get another mother's breast milk. Yeah. Yeah. I was made aware of that. I was like, really? I didn't know that. My sister-in-law donated hers. <laughs> Really should have had you all doing some presentations or something. Presentations for what? Like today, you know, talk about something. Aren't y'all tired of hearing me talk? Uh, yeah. We don't have time to hear me talk. I'm from and I had just talked to somebody about this, so I guess I did. I was laughing at somebody who did it. That was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just then, I was over it Friday after the exam. It was awesome. We were too. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. oh, wait, hold on. Try to study. Yeah. All right. I'll say it later. Okay. Yeah, so y'all kind of like know how to do the assessment and things like that. Everybody say we'll listen to the vowel sounds and... Um, as mom, you know how much the baby's been drinking, um, record that and weigh the diapers and things like that and strict intake and output and um, all of that with the assessment. So here the baby's born and now they have a cleft lip or they have a cleft palate and or they have both of them. So these are congenital defects, um, opening in the lip or the palate. <coughs> it can be one or both may occur. Does look, you know, not really frightening, but just different. Um, I've had both. Um, and you kind of like just careful with trying to feed. You know, like you have a hole in your palate, you know, you can uh, just pretty much see, you know, through and milk is draining out and it's kind of hard to feed. but. You think that is, you know, that they really won't be gaining weight, but they really do well. A special type of bottle that we use, kind of like a squeeze. Um, you squeeze it, and, you know, let them suck, squeeze, and let them suck, and things like that. Um, but they really do well, you know. What are the causes? Primarily, say genetic or environmental factors are the main causes. Could be some type of maternal infection that could have caused it, alcohol ingestion, radiation exposure, you know, all those are ter um Teratogenic things that can help happen in the environment, like right? radiation, chemicals, things like that. Um, sometimes they say smoking during that first trimester, and some medications, get a corticosteroids, and things like that, can lead to it as well. So, what do they have? The cleft lip is apparent at birth, and the cleft palate is detected through the assessment. You know, the oral <laughs> cavity, the mouth, um, and all of that. Sucking reflex and all of that. So tell me about cleft lip. Tell me some things there. It's a hole in the incomplete formation of the top lip usually. Mm -hmm. When the palate has a hole. Yeah. The palate has a hole. The best way to get formula is by like breastfeeding, probably, so that it can easily attack. Mm -hmm. a special nipple that goes that passes. <laughs> and a special bottle and a special nipple. 
kind of like a squeeze bottle. It's a, they have special bottles. It, they wouldn't be able to latch on properly at all um, due to the facial malformation of the cleft lip and even the palate. It just wouldn't be good at that time. Uh, but, you know, you yeah, you could, yeah, you have a pump for that time period, and yeah, you can give it in the bottle. Um, be aware of the milk going into the mouth if you're going to nose. Right, uh-huh. So aspiration, you, I mean, you're going to kind of see it leaking, especially with the palate. It's really different. And think about the baby that has the lip and the palate. It's, it's yeah. It's so, they normally are both together, aren't they? It's, it's, it's sometimes, not all the time, yeah. Um, and the plastic surgeries are great because after they do the surgeries, you're like, wow, you really, you know, they do. Because I had a friend that was in nursing school, she did, you know, at one at birth, and I can still tell cleft lip. You can see the just a small part, but just compared to, and she had a little bit of nasality when talking, and um, a little bit of speech today. So you know, after surgeries and things stuff like that, they're under speech therapists for a long time because they, you know, have to have that. It's an emotional reaction, you know, in the parents, right? So you got to be there for them to console them. Um, assessing the oral pharynx with the, um, and um, it's more visual with the cleft palate and more assessing the oral pharynx with the um, lip. Um, impact on the feeding, as we said. Um, treatment, um, they pretty much have a multidisciplinary team. The plastic surgeon, the pediatrician, um, orthodontist, um, otolaryngologist, um, speech therapist, all are meeting constantly trying to develop a plan. And they, these, this um, infant probably will see this, these doctors for a while, for a while. Um, so closure, um, closure of the cleft, prevention of complications, um, um, complications of normal growth and development in life and things like that. We can close that lip, cleft lip, two to three uh, months of age. Might do a Tennyson Randall triangular flap. Um, that's a type of plastic surgery. You don't really have to know that. Um, cleft palate, about six to 12 months of age. Might do some furlough, double opposing Z-plasty surgery there. Uh, no suctioning, no tongue depressors, no spoons, no pacifiers. And um, even with the cleft palate, they have like multiple surgeries. We already said speech impairment, big, big problem. So you got to jump on that, you know. And um, speech therapists, you know, all of that is very expensive. So, I, you know, insurance, I'm sure, for a while does cover it because it underlies, you know, <laughs> that, that um, disease process and things like that. So they say kind of like squeeze the cheeks and squeeze. As you're um, feeding them, you have that squeeze bottle. You squeeze their cheeks a little bit. Uh, with the cleft palate, you'll have them like upright and you do a special feeding there. Um, they do ingest a lot of air, so it is frequent burping. Um, Pre-op teaching, post-op teaching, we have to do. Want to be majorly we're concerned about what status post-surgery. Yeah. The incision site, right? Yeah. Protective of the operative site. May put a little petroleum Vaseline to the site with the cleft lip. We may have to mitten their hands, you know, so that is kind of like a um, therapeutic restraint because they will kind of like be rubbing. And so then now you might see the incision site bleeding and you know, things like that. So we may have to mention their hands. We might have to explain that to the mom and things like that. And they could have to be on their hands mitten for like seven to ten days. We may use a syringe for feeding as well for about seven to ten days as well. Right, very good. Very good. Say that again, Maya. Uh huh. Uh huh. So probably encourage the parents to hold as much as possible. We may give them a little Tylenol. We may for irritability and you know discomfort and things like that. That was very good thing because you definitely don't you don't want them crying much. You don't want them doing any of that. That is supposed any sir any one of those surgeries it could cause problems there. Um, so we already identified that right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a major 
major consummating the functional problem there are the new board is unable to create a seal around the nipple to create proper suction so they're unable to swallow normally food pools in the nasal pharynx when the infant sucks milk comes out through the cleft and out of the nose so special nipples can be used um, and that will allow um that breastfeeding may um, be um, used at different times. They maybe can. So Naya, you can ask that question. So maybe they can do a little bit of breastfeeding. It just right, right. It is, and so that's why. Yeah, it's better to bottle, but I'm sure it's going to be probably you know some mother who is breastfeeding that would choose to. But I think that the uh, proper nutrition they would get because they're still. I mean, well, the babies that I've seen, this is kind of like talking about immediately after, but I'm saying prior to even having those surgeries, you'll be surprised. You're like, wow, they're really thriving. I mean, they're really nice-sized babies, you know, who've been um, fed at home, you know, with bottles, so they do well. Um, say you can diagnose some of this um, about fetal ultrasound at 13 to 14 weeks gestation. I mean, I guess that's something for the parents to know, but I think most people still, you know, choose to have the child. But um, it said when the soft tissues of the fetal face develops, so um, it can, you know, you can maybe alert. I guess that maybe would be good to kind of like alert the parents, if parents, if the um, physician actually can detect that. I think I would, you know, rather than, um, I mean, no, you know, something like that. So nursing care is primarily focused on feeding the infant and dealing with the parental reaction of the defect mm -hmm. and how others will view their baby. Because you know, some people can really be mean about a lot of different things. And <coughs> it does say breastfeeding can be an option too. <coughs> And that is, they say, one of the chief and challenging nursing roles is educating the client, the, the parents, on how to feed their child with the cleft lip, the cleft hair, um, um, palate. Um, and, you know, they might be a little, you know, uh, upset. Maybe the baby's not, you know, fussy, irritable. You're trying, you're hoping, you know, they're getting better. So the upright position, feeding them is good. Um, a standard slit. Um, bottom nipple are unsuitable um, for the baby so that's why you need that special um, so you will need the special nipples that comes with the bottle um, they're kind of like disposable they can't use them for a period of time so you know that's kind of like portable <laughs> within the hospital and we'll prepare mom and then she'll know you know where she can get others from um, but then once you know everything heals then you know it'll be totally different then once everything heals properly so, uh, cleft lip post op, protect the operative site. Say it's something about the elbow restraints, but you know, this is therapeutic and it's just temporarily, you know, and we can even tell mom, you know, until that heals inside out. You see the major difference there? Oh, you don't see the surgery. Okay. Um, supine or sitting position. I already said about monitoring that incision site. The cleft palate may lie on their abdomen, so now they're prone at times, but we're still watching them very carefully because we already see it back to sleep, right? Um, avoid use of suction devices, spoons, straws, tongue depressors. They may have an oral packing in two to three days, and so you probably don't have to restrain them as well, too. But they will probably be a little irritable, fussy. Maybe not even wanting to eat as much. So status post coming from the um, surgery to recover to the floor, they might be on some intravenous fluids for a little while. Yeah, can make difference there. Yeah. And you see that little incision? They probably still remain there for a little while. Um, you know, I mean, they'll probably be there, and as you grow, and you know, you still probably just see a smaller scar. Um, that cleft lip is pretty should be pretty much done with surgery. The cleft palate pretty much takes multiple surgeries. And you can understand that, right? Out of the mouth. So, best thing is to have the best, you know, plastic surgeon that you can that's used to 
you know, deal with children. So esophageal atresia with trachea, esophageal fistula, what actually is happening there? He's pretty much the 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 oh. Say that again. Between the trachea and the esophagus, it's a hole between the two. Mm -hmm. What does atresia mean? It's just separated. A failed separation. Okay. And so there are rare malformations that result from failed separation of the esophagus and trachea by the fourth week of gestation. These defects may occur as separate entities or in combination, and without early diagnosis and treatment, they pose a serious threat to the <laughs> infant's well being. Occurs in about 1 to 35, um, 3,500 live births. Um, they appear equal in sex, so no greater than males or females, but the birth weight of most affected infants is significantly lower than average. <laughs> And the incidence of preterm birth is unusually high. Said you see, um, ten percent of about one in four thousand neonates um, said the proximal esophageal segment terminates into a blind pouch, and the distal segment is connected to the trachea by a short fistula. They have excessive salivation. They have drooling, and the three C's: coughing, choking, and cyanosis. It might need to be writing this, so make sure you have it. It may have some apnea. May increase in respiratory distress. We do a chest x-ray. May have some abdominal distension. Airway is important. Prevention of pneumonia. May have a gastric blind pouch decompression there. Supportive therapy. We want to try to repair the anomaly. So they receive intravenous fluids. NPO. So right whenever the baby is born, mm -hmm. do they automatically go into surgery to fix this? Or? Pretty pretty much, yeah. It pretty much happens to you know, this major. Um yeah. And try to take care of it as much as possible. You know, so it could wait for you know, a short period of time, but generally yeah. So their obsessive salivation, the drooling, the three C's, the apnea, increasing the respiratory distress during and after each feeding. So, you know, they're, you know, major chance of aspiration and all of that, abdominal distension, and so, leading to pneumonias. So it's kind of like a surgical emergency. You know, prevent that pneumonia, maintain that patent airway. Definitely going to be nothing by mouth and on intravenous fluids, head of the bed elevated. You have to do some frequent suctioning, probably on broad spectrum antibiotics. Major post stop care there. Say about the x ray, they may do a radio pad catheter is inserted into the pharynx and advanced until it encounters an obstruction, and the chest films are taken to a certain patency or to show the pouch. And you'll see the presence of gas in the stomach of a small bowel. Don't spend a lot of time there. Okay, never mind. Go ahead. No. Uh -uh. Okay, Go ahead. Is that what you're saying? I mean, radio pad. Um, cath oh, radio pay catheter. Is that what you uh huh. Radio pay. Okay. Oh, you really can't talk. Wow. Mm -hmm. Start doing sign language. Yeah. You're ready to sign. So. <laughs> I feel good. You had it pretty bad, but you don't feel bad. You don't feel bad. Ask my kids. <laughs> oh, that's all. Yeah. All right. Hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. I don't really say it. I'm not that. I don't say much. 
Anybody want to ask us something about pyloric stenosis? What do we say? So the pyloric muscle or the pyloric sphincter becomes thickened, elongated, and narrowing of that pyloric channel. Obstruction causes the baby to do what? Projectile vomiting. Mom probably, and so projectile vomiting, they, they really don't gain weight. They're eating all the time because what they're vomiting, right? So they kill it like a little, you know, may say a little uh, malnourished there too. And so they come in probably with dehydration, you know, vomiting. Um, Alkalosis may have, may have a little bit of growth uh, failure there. Detection is a lot of times delayed, like I said, because we're trying to say other things. Upper GI series, doing, you know, tests here, thinking something else, you know, thinking reflux, and we're treating them for that, and we're changing the formula, and we're doing this. And so, yeah, really have to have someone that's really kind of like experienced to jump on it and say, oh, this, that's what it is. Let me do a pyloris ultrasound. Mm -hmm. So that olive-like mass is palpable um, easily. And that's a great indicator there that they do have um, pyloric stenosis, but the ultrasound is probably the definitive test to show us that elongated sausage-like um, shaped mass. You'll hear words like that. You probably you know, see that. You know, that's a good question on NCLEX um, to make sure that you know what things to do and things like that. You'll see visible um, gastric peristaltic um, waves, um, the ultrasound. Um, mom probably trying to feed the baby every one to two hours because they're just so hungry. Um, they're, you know. So it's very, very um, emotional for the family, the parents. And so what do we have to do now? Surgery. So got to get consent form signed for a pylor myotomy. Everybody know we need to write everything out. We don't put abbreviations or anything like that for surgeries. Um, we need to make sure that mom and everybody understands what the physician will be doing. Sometimes they do not. Um, so we are the witnesses for them to come and sign. But before I am a witness, I make sure that she understands or that she needs further education from the physician. Because a lot of times they don't really know what's going on, but their signature is there. So be mindful of that as well. Um, so once they come back from surgery, um, we begin, and, and the um, physician that I worked with, he began it immediately. And they come back from surgery, we start with like Pedialyte, so many MLs, every two to four hours, and then he advanced it and even added their formula in if they tolerated. He even had the, um, it written so well that if they did not tolerate this, we go back to that, and we start with that feeding, and, so, and he's very serious about it. He wants you to be weighing the baby. He wants you to notify him if they vomit. They could have a little bit of vomiting, but nothing like it had been. And you see all of them just recover greatly, quickly. So um, they may be on IV fluids just for a little while, you know, maybe six to 12 hours, death post surgery and things like that. Um, monitoring their vital signs very carefully. And really monitoring that oral intake. And you just really gotta go by that, that regimen that that physician has for them. Uh, like pyloric regimen, that's pyloric myotomy. And um, you say tolerate so much of the pediatric, we can advance to the formula of choice that mom has been done doing, or she possibly can even try to breastfeed if that's what she's been doing. She might just have some milk for us, but she'll probably get the bottle for that period of time in the hospital. Okay. Weight loss, so signs of dehydration, everybody know that. We've already gone with those signs of um, dehydration. You see those other tests too, um, and that's what they probably will do, the upper GI study, upper GI series, um, the, uh, assessing for reflux, you know, and things like that. Um, they can evaluate the acid build up, and then they're thinking that that's what the child is, you know, but no, it's projectile vomiting. You don't really have projectile vomiting with, upper GI, with gastric reflux. You do have vomiting. So growth failure, failure to thrive, inadequate growth resulting from inability to obtain and use calories required for growth. Physical exam, we can examine this developmental assessment, family assessment, mm -hmm. how things are being done at home, how is the formula being prepared. 
or there any other things going on. Could be developmental delay a little bit, and it could cause that too as well. But most of the time, it's really something you know that we can correct. Um, heart baby, you'll see that with the CHF patient, so you can't really correct that as much unless you do, you know, depending on the type of surgeries that we do, or if we can do any. Um, but usually you can, a lot of times, um, not preparing the formula right at you know. all. Might see a patient like this come in seizing, um, cause mom been giving them water. And you know, sometimes we ran out of the milk, didn't have any formula, didn't have any money, I don't know, a week is available, you know, nationwide. So women, infants and children. So that really should not happen, but it has happened before. And they could almost die, you know, made it directly to the intensive care unit, but you know, they got things together. Sometimes you just need to ask the mother. Sometimes it's a young mother, and you just say, "God, you, yeah, no, you should mix it like that, really." And so they're, yeah, mm -hmm. had that case, you know, um, putting too much water, not enough, you know, powder, things like that. So sometimes it might be better if we can. And some of the formulas are so expensive too, you know, if they are having some type of allergies or reflux problems, you know, and things like that. They're they're very, very expensive. A lot of people just can't really afford, you know. Some kids, you know, really drink a lot, you know, so what I get from WIC, then we, it, you know, we um, run out of it before the time for, you know, to get some more and don't have the money to purchase it, so, so to be mindful of that. So, you know, just find the reason why, and then we try to, you know, teach, we work with them. Um, some preterm babies, you know, it takes a while for them to feed, you know. Uh, we've had some that, you know, maybe, um, the foster parents have them now, you know, it's a custody thing going on and, you know, but it takes 30 minutes to feed their baby, you know, staff, we don't have staff to really that long, but we have to do it, you know, to feed that baby and things like that. And we've seen that um, the doctor said for the parents not to feed and then the staff to feed because we want to see what's going on. She just said they're not, but they do fine with us and we're like, wow. You know, sometimes parents, you know, don't have the patience and the tolerance sometimes, you know, for the infant because they take so long and things like that. So finding out what really is causing it is the main thing there. So say they have inadequate calorie, uh, caloric intake, incorrect formula preparation, neglect food fats, may have excessive juice consumption, could be poverty, behavioral problems affecting eating, or could be some central nervous system problems affecting the intake. Um, celiac disease, cystic fibrosis, you know, those are other disease processes there. Hyperthyroidism problems like that. So what do they have? May have some developmental delays, apathy, poor hygiene, drawn behavior, avoidance of eye contact, wide eye <laughs> gaze and continual scan of the environment, minimal smiling. So the difference in how they look when they come to the hospital and how they look when they're leaving is it's a big difference, you know. So you want to see that that baby is thriving, hiding away, head to conference and all is measuring up to what it should be for the age. And so you have that growth chart less than the 5th percentile, greater than the 95th percentile, somebody should fall within that, you know. Sometimes we do with height, you know, let's be greater than the 95th, but we definitely want to make sure. So that's having our good well baby checkups and things like that, <laughs> physicians monitoring what they should, and the parents noticing things and you know, letting the doctors know too. So what are the goals in the nutritional management of the failure to thrive? Correct the nutritional deficiencies, achieve ideal weight for the height, allow for catch up growth, educate the parents or primary caregivers, and restore their optimum body composition. So how can we do some things and even maybe have this written out for the parents and things like that? Mm -hmm. um, this may help <coughs> a lot. The child is improving, doing better. You know, some toddlers are picky eaters. Even some children, as they get a little older, you know, they're picky eaters. Just some fruits that they don't really like. But you just want to make sure they have the proper nutrition. You know, no constipation, no diarrhea, and just you know, thriving. 
know, make the food enjoyable, you know, have the parents cook for the older children and things like that instead of all the fast food areas and all that. Eateries all the time, you know. So celiac disease, what do we know about that? Mm. Lifelong. Lifelong. What else? Mm -hmm. What kind of diet? What is some gluten? Um, no, we um, spaghetti. Um, can we have spaghetti? No. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so immune mediated enteropathy um, of the proximal small intestine triggered by inappropriate immune response. The ingested gluten and gluten related proteins found in wheat, rye, and barley. We'll see that information again in some kind of way. Lifelong malabsorption disorder. Uh, what kind of clinical manifestations do they have? Muscle wasting, anemia, irritability, steroria, so the fatty stools just like the CF patient, impaired growth, abdominal distension, and of course, a lack of energy. And if they have a crisis, they can have explosive, watery diarrhea continuously leads to dehydration and, and I mean this is the severity of a hypotensive shock. Of course they would be um, very lethargic. So we can do a biopsy of the small intestine um, that shows the mucosal inflammation and the hyperplasia there. Hyper hyperplasia. So the main thing is education because this is for life, right? And it's probably different and difficult when you say um, someone will tell you that yeah. Um, you have to be on this. These are the only foods that you can eat. So, you know, might not want to go out to eat, but, you know, very, very cautious or, you know, you just don't probably want to tell people that. But a lot of foods are what? Gluten-free now. So that helps a whole lot. But you still got to make sure that you can cause major, you know, problems for the person. It's time to make sure you know what gluten is, what the celiac disease is and what's the main safety factor, you know. You can't give that person foods with gluten in it, right? It exacerbates and make the condition worse. So that's what we're talking about when we say it's safety. You got to keep the client safe. Instruct the parents and child about lifelong elimination. Those um, things there. And extra mineral and vitamin supplements. Let's see it there. About a hernia. Let me know about hernias. Recruiting of an organ through a penis area. So what type of hernia can we have? Umbilical, ankle, What do we have to eat for those? Diaphragmatic. What do we usually do? Surgery. Yeah, usually have to make. Usually may have to do a surgery. Um, but sometimes what happens on um, the four one year of age? What happens? How can you get in milk? Go back in. Yeah. yeah. So it kind of corrects itself, right? Yeah. So um, after one year of age, we may have to do surgery. But before, we kind of like monitor, right? Then some never has it, you know. As you say, real. And you see it, you know, that area. So I guess um, you should, you know, based on what the pediatrician. But I guess if the parents refuse, you know, because people just don't want to. Um, have surgery, which I can understand that too, you know. Because anesthesia is real, you know, and these major complications with anesthesia. Just trying to find some. So, the main problem with hernias is difficulty breathing and pain, mm -hmm. right? Pretty much, main problem there. Mm -hmm. um, anything else? Anybody else want to add to that? But you fund the rest of um, what kind of problems can we have from having a hernia? Circulation, yeah. possibly. What else? You can cause it to Organ can be impaired. Yeah. Um, cause it to get worse. Yeah, cause it to get worse. Cause yourself to bleed out. You can have some hemorrhaging eventually, but we want to prevent that. You can also have. cause like little divots that we. Surgery. Yeah. Like um, the so those are the areas I'm looking for something that you can have. Um, may have epigastric, periumbilical, umbilical, lumbar. Um, so 
Christmas Julian, Femoral, and Inguinal. It's a lot of Inguinal um, and umbilical right with the children. It's a lot of them. But, you know, a lot of them do resolve on their own. Yeah, the inguinal hernia, um, it said that, yeah, I said that already, though, okay. Surgical repair, um, if it persists greater than one year. Um, and I guess that's really all I want to say. Look for a piece of paper to say that, okay. I thought I was going to say more, but you said that paper's everywhere. Intersusception, what is that? Well, it's when the proximal segment of the bowel telescopes into a more distal segment. Pulling the mesentery within it. Um, it's a common cause of intestinal obstruction in children younger than five. And they have acute sudden pain, abdominal pain. They're screaming. They draw the knees toward their chest. It appears normal and comfortable during intervals between episodes of pain. They may be very, very lethargic and may um, have some vomiting. But what do they have? Passage of red, current, jelly-like stools. So that's a very good description for you to know, not just for today, but for a long time, forever. Tender, distended abdomen, and they may have a palpable sausage-shaped mass in their upper right quadrant. The right quadrant. So what do we do for this? Uh, do we take them to surgery? What do we do? NGO. What do we do first? Try to push back. Enema. Okay, what kind of enema? Error. You are saying to do what? What are we trying to do? We're trying to do what then? We can do a saline enema because we're trying to reduce, right? Yeah. Reduce the intersusception. And the physicians are going to try to do that first. So they take them down to the radiology um, department and the radiologist does this, right? Yeah. Um, but if that doesn't work, then what? Surgery. surgery. They have to have surgery. They had a couple of them to have surgery, but most of the time, you know, the physicians, we're always going to try to do whatever we can that does not, you know, um, elicit pharmacological drugs or invasive procedures. Right. So um, they have like a um, water soluble contrast on ultrasound, and it's guided. It's a hydrostatic saline enema. You know, they do. And, um, and they decompress it. And they may put the child on antibiotic therapy. Uh, Non-operative is about an 80% chance. Non-operative, usually. But they may have to have surgery. And someone said there'll be nothing by mouth. We do all that, those labs, CBC, urinalysis, clean metabolic panel, um, parental consent, um, making sure that they're okay. If they have passage of a normal brown stool, it also indicates that the in intersusception has been reduced um, successfully. They have passage of a normal brown stool. So that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. That's a great thing. If they've reduced it, tried to reduce it down in um, radiology, and so yeah, passage of a normal brown stool is a good thing. So they may have to have surgery. Somebody say something? It may have to have surgery, but we try to do what first? And, and you all understand the descriptive of the stool there. May have a bobulus, a narrow rotation of the intestine. <laughs> may occur during embryologic development. Then it may manifest into utero, utero or may be asymptomatic throughout life. Um, 
They may have um, intermittent bilious vomiting. How do we detect it? Through upper GI series, surgery to remove the affected area. So it compromises the blood supply, which will lead to the intestinal um, necrosis, peritonitis, perforation, or death. So yeah, it's kind of like an emergent situation where we need to uh, do the surgery to make things better and uh, increase the longevity of life. Right. Imperforate anus. Sometimes children are born without an anus. Oh. Now, information include a number of anomalies of the genital, urinary, and pelvic or, um, organs, in addition, without an obvious anal opening. So, um, it's kind of like a step by step process that the surgeon does um, <coughs> to prepare them for surgery and things like that. Um, and then they go and have surgery. And, um, they generally do well. Physician comes in, status post surgery, and dilate the rectum with some dilated um, um, <laughs> instrument that he um, brings with him each time and assesses the child. And um, not before they leave the hospital, but you know, with their follow up, they're probably passing stool well and all that. Um, so prior to temporarily, they could have a colostomy, right? And then they'll do colostomy closure because now they have an anal opening where they can't pass stool. And the success rate is great, you know. It seems very serious, but, you know, um, physicians are great. Things that they can do, pediatricians, I mean, pediatric surgeons. You know. So that's the post-anal rectoplasty. That's the type of surgery that they'll do. Keep the anal area as clean as possible. Temporary dressing and drain may be in place. Um, Sideline prone position after surgery. NG2 for decompression. And they may be on some um, IV. Well, really, may be on. Um, rarely do children on, on uh, total parental nutrition, so they but they could be and on fluids as well. Um, And as I said, they'll dilate it. And here it says, sometimes with a low defect, the stool can pass through the abnormally located anus. But many times, a small opening needs to be stretched with the dilators. And if this is the case, at one stage, search procedure repair will be planned in the near future because of the anal plastic. I mean, high defects, the baby will need a colostomy uh, within the first 24 to 48 hours of life. Um, stool will drain through the stoma. So they'll have that colostomy up until the time that they go for the um, post-anal rectoplasty. And so, you know, there's some teaching and some education because mom, you know, they don't understand, they didn't know, you know, um, that their baby was going to be born like this. And so it's, it's a, you know, process and, um, you know, so they're immediately going to surgery um, after delivery or even, you know, not too much longer. It's the 20, first 24 to 48 hours of life. So that's a lot for a family to, you know, so we got to educate them, be there for them, support it. It has to be done because it probably can run into some major complications, major problems. I mean, I guess they could refuse, but, yeah, major, major there. So after the pull-through procedure, toilet training is delayed, um, prevention of constipation, um, because now, you know, got they probably a couple sutures internally and externally, you know, in the rectal area. And so we don't want them to strain and things like that. And, um, stool softeners or fiber, like we have them on diet modification, you know. Um, optimal bowel function at late childhood and adolescence and support and reassurance. So a child may be a little, you know, as they get a little older, afraid to, you know, have a bowel movement at first and things like that. Sometimes that can cause me megacolon too where the child just holds the stool and really becomes severe, they constipated, but you know, hopefully not there, but it can occur there. Well. So what is thrush? Usually the mouth can be caused by what? Antibiotics. What? Antibiotics. Antibiotics. Um, use of the pacifier with the one year old walking around. And um, just the one year old being able to walk and touch and you know, hand to mouth, hand to mouth, germs in the mouth. Um, so you see the fine little white patches in the oral mucosa on the tongue. 
and things like that. So we give them what Vicostatin, a night nest, and antifungal medication. Bring it up in a medicine cup, draw it up in a little syringe, and squirt it in the mouth. Um, it's a swish, it's, and you kind of you know spit it out. But you know with infants, you can't really do that. So sometimes we'll even like have those um, two thets and just swab, and so just coat the oral mucosa and coat the tongue, um, maybe four times a day. The child may have poor oral feeding due to that. Um, Patches cannot be removed, may bleed when touched. Um, antibiotics make an infant more susceptible to this brush. So just make sure you're all aware of the type of medication it is, and if there are any major side effects. What are some intestinal parasites? Worms, mm -hmm. worms. Mm -hmm. um, diagnosed by the Tate test. Say so a lot of children, toddlers, preschoolers might sleep on their knees um, with their buttocks in the air at bedtime, and that's kind of like an indication that position is an indication that they possibly have pin worms. Um, a lot of physicians will tell mom to take the tape, I'm going to give them the tape to take home, place it on the rectal area at night, and then, yeah, possibly if they have them, they can be very, you know, just like that picture there, very long and, and multiple, multiple, multiple. So identifying the parasite, treatment of the infection, and prevention of any initial infection or reinfection is the key there. Young children are especially at risk because of the typical hand-mouth activity and the uncontrolled fecal activity. You know, they do things, right? <laughs> yeah. And so you have to go with them, you know, to the restroom. Then as they get a little bit older, three, four, five, they don't really want you to, but then you got to make sure they clean and things like that. So now they got stool under their nails and, you know, they're eating the chips and, you know, things like that. So you got to just be, you know, careful with them. They do, you know, they're kids. So, you know, they're babies, you know, they don't know. And so... And in daycares, you know, proper, you know, changing of diapers and hand washing is the key. And we just really should try to hand wash our hands, wear gloves when we are handling stool and, you know, infectious agents and things like that. And re-glove and wash hands and all that. So that's a whole other lecture probably that we won't do today. So sometimes... um the medication of choice is Vermox that they may give um, for any type of these anti-helminetic um, the treat them, the pin worms and things like that. Um, I think it's very nasty taste, yeah, but it takes care of the problem, but, you know, um, as I can remember, sometimes it's like a grayish in color and things like that, and kids don't like it. A lot of medications like vancomycin and even that, where you cannot, uh, they don't want you to alter with syrups and stuff like that because you kind of can decrease the potency in it. And so you have to be careful with that. Gastroenteritis, I think we kind of like covered. Someone who's had severe the vomiting, dehydration, I mean, vomiting, diarrhea, nausea leads to gastroenteritis. Um, could be for several reasons why someone develops gastroenteritis. Could be just viral, you know. Um, and so strict intake and output. Main thing is we want to try to treat, as we say, treat the cause with that oral rehydration therapy that we've gone over. And we have, definitely don't want them to have to come to the hospital. So sometimes they do, you know. That they have to be admitted, you know, for dehydration and extreme fluids and all of that. You may see them on a probiotic, lactobacillus, um, as well. It puts the good bacteria back into the intestinal area. Well, rickets and scurvy, do I need to say much about that? Vitamin D deficiency, the scurvy vitamin C deficiency. What happens with the vitamin D deficiency? What is it? Bow legged. Are, are, are our toddlers kind of bow legged anyway at birth? Mm -hmm. The way it continues on. Uh, what about the scurvy? <laughs> What else? Nose, legs, Nose rashes. Legs. Mm -hmm. rashes. So how do we, um, can we correct both of those? Yeah. And what else can we get? What What else gives us a lot of vitamin D? D, sunlight. Uh, sunlight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. The 
next one is on hyperemesis gravidarum, but that's on uh, next week. Disregard it. That's for the adult. That's for the mother. So disregard for this week? Yeah. Yeah, that one. That's for mom. It'll be on uh, exam during. So this is the week. Yeah. What time is it? Ten after. Yeah, we want those breaks. Y'all need a break? Yeah. 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 Right. Excretion, do we need to say much about excretion? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can tell them about excretion. Wow, that's how you want me to say I'll just take points. I mean, I want all of them. I want to say that. Just what are the key points? There may be a lot of points that you still miss. I tried finding it, but I didn't download the thing. Miss Hosey, do you still work no. over at Women Children's? Oh, oh I have any. How, how long ago did you work there? 2007. For how many years before that? 17. So were you there? In, so that means you were there in 98. Uh-huh. My daughter was in there in the NICU. Really? She was born with a diaphragmatic hernia. Then yeah. it's um, Brenda. It's Brenda L. Ezer L. Sir. She's got long, long brown hair. She just retired from there last year. So you probably. She was there for 30 days. So we were there for a long time. So you yeah. Oh, no, because I, I live over there. I live in Green Bay. So, yeah, they kept telling me I needed. They kept telling me that I needed to go home and rest because she'd be coming home eventually, and I just couldn't leave her all the time. She's tw she's twenty days. <laughs> it was really hard when I got pregnant with the second one because I was worried it was going to happen to him, you know. But um. Yeah, the doctor that fixed her, he waited a week before he did the surgery.